Yo, Zach, there's something over here. Um, is that what I think it is? Uh, it's either a hog nose or a pygmy. Come here, have a look. I can't see his head. Wait, no, oh, it's a pygmy. It's a pygmy. No, it's not. Come here and look. Come here and look. <laughs> right, wait, 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 right. Right in there. Oh, my. Ah! <laughs> How dare you come to my state? One year ago, I went down to Louisiana to learn the ways of catching venomous snakes with Zachary Gray, a local wildlife expert and good friend of mine. I got my first hands-on experience with venomous snakes and spiders, but what most of you don't know is on my last day in Louisiana, while exploring some of the Gulf Coast's pine forests, we stumbled upon one of the southern United States' rarest pit vipers. That footage had never been released because it sparked a journey spanning multiple states, tracking down true ghosts of North American wilderness. A journey that ends today. This guy is kind of a, kind of a unicorn. This is an insane little pit viper that we did not at all expect to find. So seeing him out here right now is already like a crazy highlight of the trip. What's really interesting to look at is I love how he has that orange stripe down his back. Now, if you look from, from your angle right here, you probably can barely see him. You only can probably know because you saw where he was located when I actually walked up on this guy. The camouflage is absolutely insane. That, that speckling and those spots down his back, as well as that orange stripe, what they do is they serve to actually dissolve his outline. He doesn't actually match the environment out here. I wouldn't say that he would look like anything out here per se. It's not a mimic kind of camouflage like you see with like a walking stick or a Katie did. This guy has a kind of camouflage that's mostly used. Uh, that modeling pattern is gonna make his outline hard to see. So if I'm, if I'm like 30 feet back from him, he's gonna blend right into the environment simply because he doesn't look like a snake. And he's gonna be able to use that as an advantage against all the things he'll be hunting out here. In fact, he probably isn't even actively hunting most of the time. At his size, he's vulnerable to pretty much anything that flies out here. Lots of different things could eat a pygmy rattlesnake, which means he is in a lot of trouble if he moves around too much. So he'd probably be staying tucked away in little pockets of debris, just like this one is, in that coiled up ambush position. The pygmy rattlesnake is an ambush hunter, and they're athletic. For such a small snake, they have an incredible strike capacity. And these two things play really well together. These snakes can coil up in a little crevice underneath a log or something where most other ambush hunters won't be able to fit, giving their prey a false sense of security. A little lizard or frog or something will be crawling or hopping along next to a log, and that snake can lash out and grab them. That's what makes these snakes so difficult to study. They're so small, compact, and camouflaged. They're just hard to turn up. But in most of their range, given how rare this snake is, it's so tough to actually find one. And that's why stumbling across this Western pygmy rattlesnake is so incredibly special. Pygmy rattlesnake. Cannot believe we found you out here. That is nuts. See that little tongue going. He definitely can sense there's two large mammals right here and they're definitely not prey. So he is in defense mode. If one of us were to take a bite, it'd be pretty bad, but it's not, it's not his fault. It's our fault for getting into space. Absolutely incredible little find. And uh, this is uh, this is something you don't usually see, right, Zach? Hey, bro, heck you, bro. You can't run out of North Carolina <laughs> find a pygmy. Yeah, that was my, I walked through here. All around us, even right outside our doors, there is a secret world that exists right alongside ours. Creatures of all shapes and sizes living out entire sagas unknown to most of us. Zach and I are some of those who spend a long time in this parallel world, learning its secrets and uncovering its treasures. Each animal is like a hidden item uncovered in a video game, sometimes by accident, like this pygmy rattlesnake, other times by undergoing trials and tribulations, solving puzzles in the habitat and carefully tracking down some of the more special secrets that the natural world has to hide. I break these secrets into four basic groups. They're the staples, animals that are plentiful and abundant in a given habitat, and not all that special. Lots of them are a good sign, but none of them are worth targeting. A step up from that is neat. 
It gets a double take, sure, but it's still nothing to write home about. The animals that people like Zack and I target start at wild. They're exciting, maybe have really interesting coloration or appearance, maybe slightly rare, or have a unique and special biology that make them unusually exciting to find, but one of them wouldn't make an outing special. It's animals of the gem tier that carry real weight. Animals so special that a trip where you find one is a truly memorable experience. Those of you who have followed the channel for a long time know these tiers well, but what if I told you there was a secret tier above Gem? A tier so special it was reserved only for animals like this western pygmy rattlesnake. Animals who are so seldom seen they have disappeared into songs and legends. These animals, whose encounters forge lifelong friendships that make stories you carry with you for years to come, the creatures that you can't believe are real even when you're staring them in the face. These animals are the legends of the natural world. And while we stumbled upon this western pygmy rattlesnake by accident, it's one of the three legendary pygmies that call the southeast US home, and this encounter has got me hungry to track down the other two. So I decided to join Zach a year later on an expedition to Florida, where the second subspecies is a stronghold, to learn the ways of the pygmy rattlesnake and hopefully track down the scarlet serpents of my home state of North Carolina, the Carolina pygmy rattlesnake. On our first day in the longleaf pine forest of northwestern Florida, it's jaw-dropping how similar this habitat looks to the marsh we found the western end back in Louisiana. This is the domain of the dusky pygmy rattlesnake, probably the most common of the three. If I want to master hunting this snake, this is the right place to do it. Now in this habitat, you're going to get both rattlesnake species, both pygmies and diamondbacks, and this is really perfect area for them. It's got the savannas, it's got the lowlands, it's got the hammocks. Every kind of habitat imaginable for these species to live next to each other is here. Uh, they're typically in the morning times, like right now, going to be kind of out coiled up, and then in the evening times, move around a bit more to get to a new burrow or get to a new area. So we do have multiple chances to see one. They are quite common in this region of Florida, so I would kind of expect to see one, but you never know. I'd say it's about 50-50. I'm hoping that we see both of our species though, because they are really cool snakes. There's two basic methods we can use to find these snakes. Hiking habitat and road cruising. But in the morning, they're more likely to be moving from cover to cover out in habitat. So we're actually, we've spread out, we're actively hiking and scanning the ground, looking for any signs of movement. What's really frustrating though, is that they're so camouflaged and they're so small and compact, they can really fit under cover that we're probably walking past dozens. This is dangerous because one wrong step and you know, we've got a hospital trip worthy envenomation event, but it's also our best shot at finding them. Um, road cruising the first day we actually had pretty much no luck. In fact, the only venomous snake we found was one of our main targets, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake, but it was dead and had been hit probably only an hour or two before we found it. So, um, you know, that, that in itself is another reason why, like, what I'm doing here is so important. See, you know, preserving habitat for these animals is not enough. You know, both of these snakes are relatively habitat specific, but, but preserving their habitat is not enough because even in prime habitat, you know, that diamondback, there's no missing that snake. That snake was hit and killed on purpose. And, you know, these, these animals are targeted just because they're venomous snakes. This is why education about these animals is just so important. We were getting kind of aggravated because for as good of an area we were in, we weren't seeing very much. Uh, but on day two of hiking, we're out way off the trail and Zach actually alerted to something that was in a, uh, in a palmetto scrub nearby. Piggy. Wait, no. Okay. No. Piggy. He's under the leaf. Look. Oh, wow. Go on. He's white. He's got a lot of white. There he is. All right, he's on the move. I'm going to have to. Well, now he's cloning up. That's good. These guys are really wiry, and we don't want him to escape on me. The way he's coiled up, he is just like a little landmine. But these. Duskies are extra impressive. We work with a lot of different venomous snakes here. Most of them have strike ranges that are about half to two thirds their body length. But especially when he's coiled up just like this, they can strike to about here, which is a little over his body length. And that's a little bit insane, but if you think about it, this is an athletic little snake. And when he's coiled up like this, he can actually use this layered coil as a springboard and just lunge sending his entire body airborne, and they are deadly accurate. So if you are in the, in the path of this snake, 
you're gonna get bitten. Now, fortunately, toxicity of the venom is not horrible. You could die, and any viper bite is a serious envenomation event, and you should go to the hospital like a smart person would. Now, you can see right here, this snake, he's coiled up, and when he does move, he tries to move away from us. Yeah, I got a guy behind the camera there, Bradley's over there watching this whole thing unfold. I'm right here, but this snake is not showing any sign of aggression. And even if he did try to bite one of us, let's face it, who is actually being more aggressive in this situation, us or the snake? We came into this snake's habitat. We bothered him when he was hanging out underneath his little palmetto. He's not bothering us. He's not trying to pick a fight or anything. He just wants to get back to hunting little toads and frogs that live on the uh, understory of this longleaf pine forest. He wants nothing to do with us humans. Florida is the stronghold for pygmy rattlesnakes and the following days proved it. Rattlers of every life stage popped up, demonstrating a really healthy population. Look at this little snake. He may be tiny, but don't underestimate him. A bite from this little tiny guy would still land you in the hospital. These pygmy rattlesnakes are no joke. It is incredible to see this little guy out here, probably crossing the road to get out of the way of the rain and find a little burrow to hunker down in until it passes. A little tiny tail, he's so cute. He's looking at me. Fortunately, he's not coiled up or anything. I think we kind of just caught him mid crawl. He's a little confused as to what's going on. I don't think he feels particularly angry about this. He's just waiting to see what we're gonna do and then go back about his way. This would probably be this year's hatchling and that's, that's kind of, promising here in uh, here in florida these pygmy rattlesnakes have a nice stronghold we've seen quite a few of these while cruising the roads out here this week and this right here is a tiny little baby and that is the most promising thing you know where i'm from in north carolina the pygmies are disappearing like crazy where zach's from louisiana you, you don't see him anymore but right here we have the next generation of florida pygmies emerging and getting ready to go out and do their thing. That is insane. Super, super encouraging. It's nice to see these snakes are doing well, at least somewhere. Beautiful little guy. And with them doing well, it's lots of practice and data I can take home to North Carolina. Somewhere deep in the coastal wilderness, rumors of deep red pygmy rattlesnakes swirl. A scarlet serpent that is disappearing from the planet as we speak, as its habitat shrinks and the stragglers are killed simply for being snakes. I'm joined by Harrison and Evan from the Wildlife Brothers and Emilio Pasmino from Animal Encounters on perhaps the most difficult search I've ever embarked. The coast of North Carolina is not just beaches and sun. The pine forests that call it home are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet and are rich with reptile life. We came out with leads from a few of our reptile enthusiast friends, but having sourced information from people who search very different parts of the North Carolina coastline, we ran into a bit of a problem from the get-go. Um, just so everyone is aware, we know this general part of North Carolina is good for wildlife, but when we texted our buddies who we know have experience in this area about where they usually hit, it's three hours from here. <laughs> so, no one can question our resolve as herpers because anything we find on this trip, we will have not only found the wildlife by ourselves, but we've picked up on the spots ourselves as well. I think this is more gratifying, personally, yep. and I wish more people did this in herping. We but are sticking to the, the motto, get outside, find, find your, your adventure. adventure. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> You're right. right. So we're deep in coastal North Carolina wilderness with no leads. Off to a great start. All right, so we've stopped for a little hiking break. Well, it's still sunset. We haven't found anything yet, but look at how beautiful this habitat is. Like, and this open power cut here. We have so much room to move and I've been called, I've been summoned. So what have we, what have we got here? Sorry. This is the Northern Cottonmouth and an adorable juvenile at that. We know that it's a juvenile, aside from the size, by that incredible coloration. Cottonmouths, as they age, become a lot more dull, but this individual is a beautiful, has beautiful bright coloration and if you look, Right at the tip of the tail, Emilio can indicate that because we are not going to get close enough. We are not going to get close enough to this animal for it to take a bite at us. But right at the end of the tail there, you notice how it's that kind of yellow color? 
that is actually used as a lure. A lot of vipers here in the United States have that ability to use their tail like a lure to attract prey in. So they'll wiggle it right in front of their mouths and as soon as a lizard or a frog or even a small even a small mammal comes up, they will reach out, grab it, envenomate it, and then swallow it down. The coastal habitat here is incredible. It is so different than anything I'm used to, and it's just rich with incredible animals. Like we found so many, so many reptiles that I don't see back home in central North Carolina, including some really special encounters, but the pygmy rattlesnakes were just, just eluding us. We were actually um, we were actually cruising back to our Airbnb when we happened to cross a group of there were a group of people. They were like, they had like equipment. They were like poking around in the in the uh, in the brush. So we we pull over and we asked what they were doing. And it turns out they were forestry workers for, for North Carolina, and uh, they were doing some kind of like replanting project. And they asked what we were doing, and we're just like, oh, we're looking for snakes. They're like, oh, you're looking for snakes? We're like, yeah. And they're like, you ever see one of those red pygmy rattlesnakes? And we're like, well, that's exactly what we're looking for. And they're like, oh, there's this one road down this way. You just, uh, you go over the road and off the side, there's this canal and you cross the canal. There's a path hidden in the marsh somewhere. I mean, they gave, it was awesome. They gave us the location, but it's so funny to think about like the, the way they're describing this, this spot for pygmy rattlesnakes. It's like, it's so cryptic. It's like some kind of like pirate treasure clue or something. Like we're literally out here in the coastal longleaf pine forest on a treasure hunt only we're not looking for pirate gold, we're looking for venomous reptiles. We followed the road in question around a bend. As the habitat shifted, I knew the lead was right. Looking at our surroundings, if I'd been blindfolded and dropped here and told it was the same marsh we found the western pygmy in back in Louisiana, I would have believed it. Now, the only trick is finding the hidden trail. So we're looking for it here. There's literally supposed to be a trail hidden in this swamp somewhere. Now what we have found is a tree we that could can get us further in, so I'm we, gonna try this. We could cross there. Yeah, the lead we have, there's supposed That's to be a trail in here. But I don't even like the way this ground is crunching beneath my feet. And I don't know how deep this little canal is. Let's see how deep the canal is. Are you gonna wade? Is it over your boots? Oh, I'm sinking fast. He's sinking. Uh, get out of there. Yeah, careful, Amelia. I'm sinking pretty fast. Actually, can someone give me a hand? Yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. Went out. Oh, shit. Ah, oh, right. thanks. Right. How was that, Harrison? Not too bad. Any sign of the trail back there? Not yet. Okay, I'm looking down and I'm seeing instant regret. I have shorts and tennis shoes. That's poison ivy. That's a rotted log. That's a muddy canal. Getting across there, is not gonna be fun. This grass is really sketchy. Any any bit of this could give way to a little sinkhole. And also, you can't see the ground. And theoretically, this is not the, the pygmy rattlesnake spot, but theoretically they're here underneath our feet. And one wrong step could be a bite. Look at this place. Something just moved past my leg. I don't know what that was. Yep. Could be uh, all kinds of stuff in here. We are literally knees deep. In grass. Saw grass. Probably ticks. Oh yeah. Ticks, oh boy. Mud. All the fun things about hiking in a marsh. But with any luck, this brutal hike will pay off with some pretty incredible snakes. You know what, guys? Right up here actually might be the path. <laughs> Jeez, this is. We have it. This is like what you. I barely call this a path, but... We were told that it wasn't a pleasant stroll through a nature park. This is real hiking Jeez, look here. look at this. It's matted down vegetation, but that's all it takes to get some cool stuff. That is somewhat of a path, yeah. More so than what we were just trekking through anyway. Hopefully this gives us a rattlesnake. As soon as I entered that trail, I knew we were in the right spot. You get this, you get this feeling when you're in the, uh, when you're in the presence of, of an animal that's just truly legendary. It's like the, the air gets like, like stiller and the world just gets quieter. And, you know, all of your senses just laser focus in on the moment. 
um, because every every passing second is is a fleeting moment where you know that creature is going to potentially show up and then disappear forever. I've only felt it a handful of times, and every single time it was in an area with truly, truly special wildlife. We arrived at a pretty difficult time of day. The temperature was already hot, and since it was later morning, it's possible that all of the snakes in this area have already finished basking and have disappeared into the surrounding marsh to hunt for the day. We hiked this ridge back and forth for hours and found nothing. Given that these snakes are endangered and increasingly rare as time goes on, the possibility that we would not see one of these rattlesnakes began to dawn on us. As the sun began to beat down on us and time grew short, Evan devised a plan. Harrison and Emilio have gone up the trail and Spencer and I are gonna wait here about three minutes just to give a little bit of distance between their search party and ours. That way, if they miss a pygmy hiding in the brush or one decides to cross the trail after they've already scanned an area, Spencer and I might pick it up. It's, it's funny how we, um, we changed our strategy and it's like the, the pygmy rattlesnakes in the area just, they're like, oh, they're using real tactics now, we give up. Cause I mean, I, I kid you not, five minutes after we recorded this, that segment explaining, explaining the new strategy, Evan and I are out like just getting B-roll on backup cameras, not even our main cameras, like backup cameras. And we catch this. Dude, there's one right here. What? There's one right here. No, Wait. Wait. I curled up in the shade. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, it's huge. That is a big pygmy rattlesnake. Wow. All right. That guy is a Carolina pygmy rattlesnake. One of the most localized rattlesnake subspecies that you can find in the entire United States. This subspecies of rattlesnake can only be found in a few select parts of the Carolinas. And this particular area in North Carolina is one of their last remaining strongholds. It is unreal to see this animal. An animal there was no guarantee that we would get to actually see in the wild. And not only do we get to see it, that is a stunning individual. These snakes are incredible. And just like the other larger pit vipers here in the US, they are dangerously venomous, which puts a big target on their back for destruction by those who don't understand them. To most, this is an evil snake, a reptile with the capacity to kill that needs to be eradicated at all costs. But the truth is, these rattlesnakes are just simple creatures trying to make their way in the universe, no different than any of us. You can see it in this snake's eyes, just how confused it is as to why these four large humans are all encroaching on its space, taking tons and tons of pictures of it. This is not the face of an evil monster, but a startled and confused reptile that really just wants to get back into the marsh to hunt for frogs. Their venom is a tool that they use to hunt their prey and defend themselves if necessary. These snakes are important parts of the ecosystem, serving as predators to keep lizard and amphibian populations in check, and to be food for the birds of prey that call these marshes home. They're such misunderstood and little studied creatures that it's truly hard to say exactly what the world would look like if the pygmy rattlesnake were to disappear forever. But that reality comes ever closer to coming to pass. And more than ever, the world needs to hear messages like this about these beautiful reptiles before they're gone for good. As the Scarlet Serpent slithered back into obscurity in the coastal marsh, I stood in awe of this fleeting yet transformative encounter. Just a year ago, I was getting my bearings with venomous snakes. Now here I was having tracked down a rare venomous beauty in my home state. My friends and I went the distance with a singular goal and were rewarded with indisputable victory. Out there in the secret world all around us, many more legends lurk and together we need to raise awareness of these special animals so that they can be preserved for the future. One such animal, possibly even more sensitive and hard to come by than the pygmy rattlesnake, is the gorgeous red salamander. I went after these amazing amphibians with Zach back in Louisiana, so if you want to see that adventure, check it out right here. Hope to see you there, but until next time, don't forget to get outside and find your own adventure.